Um, so hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's webinar, which is brought to you by Div Advisory Services in the Roscommon Longford region. Uh, the topic we'll be covering this evening is New Organic Scheme 2022. My name is Owen Callaghan, I'm a Welsh Scottish student based in the Castlery office and I'll be hosting tonight's webinar. We have two speakers tonight, Joe Kelleher and Enda O'Hart. The two lads will be speaking for 20 minutes each, followed by 20 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, Penny Gavin will be taking the questions and answers session. So if you could please send in any questions by typing them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen and all questions that will be answered live after the two lads have presented. So to introduce our two speakers, we have Endo Hart, who's organic specialist in the Roscommon Longford region, and Joe Keller, the head organic specialist in the country. Penny Gavin, who's taking the question, questions and answers, is a Walsh scholarship student based in the Roscommon office. Um, just before we start, um, I just want to notify you of a few things. Um, the first is that BPS is now open, so ring the office to organise any time with your advisor. Um, I suppose this year in particular is very important that all land parcels are entered in correctly with the new cap coming in 2023. Um, secondly, AATS course about the new environmental schemes and practices will be running in the coming months. Anyone who's interested in these uh, can contact your local office and you'll be put on the list. Um, farmers will receive €156 Euro to attend the one-day course. Uh, attendance is voluntary and it is open to all farmers who submit a valid BPS. Then lastly, the sp Spring Beef Grass Walk is tomorrow, Tuesday the 8th of March at 11am on the farm of Gavin White in Abbey Shrule, County Longford. Um, his air code is N39X967. Um, we'll be discussing spring fertilizer application, the value of slurry, making the most of soil sample results and ensuring you make enough silage in 2022. Um, so without further ado, I'll throw it over to Joe. Uh, if you want to start sharing your screen, Joe. Thanks, Owen. Hopefully you can see that there now. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Owen. Good evening to everyone. So I suppose I'm just going to cover uh, maybe the thought process for anyone that's thinking of going organics uh, and uh, the the, what would have to happen inside the farm gate really as much as anything else. So I'm going to try to cover uh, a lot of the sectors kind of differently. Um, I'm aware there is uh, pockets of tillage in, in the area we're in tonight, so I'm just going to uh, touch on it there. Uh, it's become very topical um, in the last few days. We, we could all be tillage farmers um, by the time tomorrow is over, uh, depending on what way the, the, the meeting goes. So this slide, I will use the gloss over it before, is becoming more important uh, in the last few days. So I suppose yeah, for anyone, for a tillage farmer that is contemplating organics, these are the key questions that a tillage farmer has to ask themselves. Uh, first of all, can you incorporate a grass or clover break into your rotation? Uh, it's it's the same in conventional as it is in organic. If we continue to grow um, tillage crops in the same field year after year in the same crop, we are going to run into issues with disease and pests. Uh, therefore, we have to put in a rotation. Secondly, the clover, like you see in that picture there, the red clover is great at fixing nitrogen and, and building up the fertility in the field. The crops will remove uh, the fertility out of the field, but by putting clover in, you can get the nitrogen in particular back in. And then the second line there is do you have a source of on-farm nutrients? So do you like your farm your manures, your slurries? They will put the peas and K's back in. So we want the clover to get the nitrogen into the ground and we want the, the other materials then for getting the peas and K's. Uh, depending on your area, you might have access to products like um, free range poultry manure, you're allowed to bring that onto organic farms, dairy sludge from certain processors is permitted to be brought onto organic farms. Um, so if you can, if you can access materials like that, or even slurry or farmyard manure from your conventional neighbour are permitted to be brought onto organic farms. Um, so the access to these materials is, is vital if you're thinking of going into um, organic tillage, uh, that, and that's why it fits in best in a mixed farming system with livestock. Uh, 
And the third and final point is, can you see yourself farming without pesticides and chemical fertilizers? Um, for a lot of tillage farmers, I suppose these are the two main crutches that we have to rely on uh, in conventional settings. So in organics, you're asking farmers to drop these two tools and to work probably more in nature and work with the clovers and the palmyre manures uh, and pick disease resistant varieties. Um, so they're, they're the three quick three key questions you need to ask yourself if you're a tillage farmer con uh, contemplating organics. So to move on then to the livestock uh, sectors, I suppose the key uh, question that we're always asked is what stocking rate can I carry in organic farming systems? And the reality is, is that there's no one answer. There's no one size fits all. It all very much depends on the type of land you're on and your situation. So if we take a dairy cow here grazing, if you can imagine the best of soils in the country, uh, deep brown earths, free draining, you can grow any crop you want in it. Uh, you can grow multi-species swords, as you see there in the picture. You can grow uh, red clover, white clover. You can put in whole crop silage. You've lots of options. Um, so that, that kind of a scenario would be capable of carrying uh, closer to the upper limit of the stocking rate allowed in organics, which is two livestock units per hectare or 170 kgs of organic nitrogen. So that's that's assuming there's high levels of clover. There's probably a bit of red clover on that farm um, and you've access to a lot of nutrients as well. Then you could be looking at the upper the upper limit in terms of stocking rate. But I suppose the more typical scenario is what we're looking at here is probably a heavy clay type soil um, with a bit of rush content in it, uh, high rainfall area. Um, again, we wouldn't be probably contemplating uh, plowing up the likes of this because these pastures are very diverse pastures and species rich and have a huge uh, habitat value and biodiversity value. So we'd be trying to maintain these as much as possible. And what we would be saying in the scenario, like you see in that picture there, is that you match your stocking rate to what's on the farm or what the farm can grow naturally. And in that picture, that is probably nearer to one livestock unit per hectare is probably what you would be pitching your stocking rate at there. So what we see in this picture up here, the clovers and the multi-species, where we really target those in an organic setting is where you have um, a monoculture of ryegrass. Uh, that, so fields that have been sown in the last 10 or 20 years and there's only ryegrass in them, they're the ones we're targeting to get the clover into or the multi-species into. If you have diverse species with a bit of rush content and a lot of the old species of grasses, we'd be saying leave them alone and to far match the stocking rate to what they can grow naturally. The third scenario then is, is, is this scenario here, which is a, a hill sheep farm we see here and uh, very large in the land, uh, not capable of carrying very high stocking rate at all. And the minimum stocking rate in organics to get the full payment is 0.15 of a livestock unit per hectare. And that is probably the most appropriate stocking rate for that farm. And indeed, even in some situations where the sheep are outwintered on hills like that, uh, that, that stocking rate can even be prove a bit high for certain farms. So as you can see, there, there, there are three completely different scenarios and three completely different stocking rates. And the crops that are grown on those farms are completely different as well. So it's a case of everyone has to picture where where do I fit in between those three three pictures? Uh, where is my farm sitting and then where is the stock on it? So we've two livestock units per hectare, we've one livestock unit per hectare, and we've 0.15. So the question is, is where do you fit into that, that scene of things? And that's where you should be pitching your stock and rate. So if we look a bit closer then at the cattle system. So the first question there we've kind of touched on that is your stock and rate below two livestock units per hectare. Um, and are you willing to drop it if you're in if your land quality is, is only capable of carrying one livestock unit or maybe even less? The second big one for uh, both beef and sheep farmers is can your animal housing be modified to incorporate a, lie, a bedding lie area? So one of the key rules in organic farming is that 50% of the floor area has to be solid floor area embedded with a suitable material, which is typically straw. So can you get that, that lie back area incorporated into your sheds easily enough? And we'll take a look at it, an example there in a minute. And then the third question is, do you already use no or relatively low levels of artificial fertilizers? If you are using very low levels of fertilizers, and we all know what's happened with the price of fertilizer at the moment, then maybe it's a logical step to take with the next step and get rid of that pallet or two of fertilizer that you have been using. Maybe cut back a small bit in stock numbers and look at organic farming as a, as a potential option. We look at sheep systems, 
Uh, quite similar again, are you spreading fertilizer at all? In a lot of cases, there's zero fertilizer going out on, on, on sheep farms, especially hill sheep farms. And um, if so, then maybe it's a very natural fit for you. Do you outwinter your sheep or do you have access to straw bedded sheds? So this picture here is, is, is again what we'd like to see or else outwintering up here is, is equally acceptable. So we can outwinter or if your housing, they have to be on a straw bedded. It's the same rule as there is with cattle. You can't have your sheep on 100% slats. They have to have access to a, a, a straw bedded lie back area. And then the, the, the final question, I suppose, in the sheep is, can you avail it a full payment by meeting the minimum stocking rate? So if you're under the 0.15, you will get what's called a pro rata payment. Um, but if you can get to the 0.15 livestock unit, which is the same as the disadvantaged dairy payment stocking rate, then you will get the full payment. And again, I have a slide there in a minute just to show how that works. And this, this is it here. So if we just take, there was, there was, the new scheme that was brought in there, the organic farming scheme that was opened on the 9th of February, uh, there was two key changes to that scheme. And the first one was that the, instead of getting paid on a maximum of 60 hectares, that went up to 70 hectares. And the second change was that the minimum stocking rate went from 0.5 of a livestock unit down to 0.15. So if we look at how that impacts, and this is, this is probably the most extreme example now of this, I accept that, but just to show the impact, it, can have on this category farmer. I have this slide in here. So if you take a farmer with 70 yos and 70 hectares under the old OF scheme, OFS scheme, which was there last year, that farmer would only have been paid on the 60. So it's now gone up to 70, but in the old scheme, you get paid on 60 by 220, which was a potential payment of 13,200. But you only got that if you met the minimum stocking rate, which was a half a livestock unit per hectare. Now, let's say this farmer has 70 yos and 70 hectares and a yo is 0.15 of a livestock unit. So that's farmer stocking rate is the equivalent of 0.15 of a livestock unit per hectare. And that works out at 30% of the minimum under the scheme. So that farmer then got 30% of the payment available. So he or she got 30% of this figure, which ended up being 3,960. So just shy of 4,000 euros is what that farmer would have got last year in the organic farming scheme. If we look at what the changes have made, the impact they have made to this farmer. So under the new scheme now, instead of 60 hectares, that farmer gets paid on 70. So the maximum payment goes up to 15,400. And the minimum stocking rate has dropped to 0.15. So that farmer now is meeting the minimum stocking rate. So they're going to get the full payment. So the pro rata payment is gone. So that farmer now receives 15,400 instead of 4,000 in, in, in the conversion periods in organic. So it's, it's a huge impact on that category farmer. And I suppose it's, it's one that's hard to look past if you are in, if you have that range of land or, or you are in that um, scenario. So it, it, it is having a big impact on that category farmer. So let's look at, go back to the dry stock side of things again. So as I said, one of the rules is that 50% of the floor area has to be straw bedded lie back. The other 50% can be slatted. So this is the typical example where we see this was a, a North Galway. This was taken only two or three weeks ago. And when this farmer had a shed and he had a lie back, but it finished there at that pillar, if you can see it there on the screen in the top left corner. Um, so he didn't have the 50% lie back. So he added six feet onto his shed to give him that 50% uh, lie back area. So it is a relatively uh, cheap conversion for him. And I suppose sometimes when we hear straw bedded lie backs, we think we've put on this massive shed out the back of the slatted shed. But in some cases, it doesn't have to be that big an investment. Uh, something fairly handy, like you see in that picture there, um, will equally do the job. And I'll come back to that picture there again in, in a minute. If we look at what, what space is actually needed for the cattle in our slatted sheds or our straw bedded sheds, um, I suppose these are the figures that are from the organic uh, standards. And I suppose the one figure that I would point out maybe is this one here, one meter squared per 100 kilos. As a rough rule of thumb, it isn't too far off the mark. I know these figures will be slightly out from it, but if you had that in your head, you wouldn't be a million miles off the mark. So if we take a 500 kilo bullock, that 500 kilo animal needs five meters squared. Each animal needs five meters squared. Of that five meters squared, half of that has to be straw bedded. The other half can be slatted. So if we go back to our picture in the previous slide, and we look at it, and let's say this pin here, let's say this is a four meter deep slat. So that has to be a four meter deep uh, straw bedded area. And let's say the bay for to keep, sorry, to keep the figures round, let's say it's a five meter wide bay. So we've eight meters by five meters, we've 40 meters squared. And let's assume these are, are 500 kilo bullocks. So that means they need five meters squared each. So that means we can keep eight of them in that pin if we wanted to. 
Uh, so that's that's kind of the basic sum you need to do if you're trying to figure out what do I need to do to my sheds to, to make them eligible for the organic farming scheme. Uh, it's simple maths like that and just do a rough calculation. That is a very simple setup. Even here, this gate here actually swings out here and latches onto this pillar here. So what he does is he locks his, his bulls in here into this pin and he comes in with his tractor from the far upside and he's able to clean out that straw bedded area then every few weeks. Um, so it's, it's as I say, it's a typical example of, of what could and can be done uh, to convert your housing. The other misconception I would call it when it comes to organics is the veterinary. A lot of people think that you can't use any products uh, that were allowed in conventional in, in once you go organic and you couldn't be further from the truth. The reality is that you can use pretty much all the products that you are using in conventional farming. The, the big difference is what happens before and after you use the product. So the key thing with the before is that the vet has to pretty much sign off on everything. So when you join organic farming, and then there's going to cover this in a while, you're going to have to do what's called a health plan and you list what you're going to use on the farm. Um, and the vet is the key to, to that. And he will say what you can and can't use. And if an animal, the, the, one of the core requirements is an animal in organics is not allowed to suffer. So if an animal needs a certain product to avoid pain or suffering, then that animal gets that product. The key Thing, then what happens afterwards is that the withdrawal period if you look at the this bowl right is pretty much double there is a few kind of caveats to that um in particular with poultry where it's it's there are certain uh, uh, kind of uh, other figures other than double but if you for animals you can take it that it, for most cases it's double the withdrawal period uh, so if it says in the bottle 28 days you've to with your withdrawal period is 56 days for that animal so once you give that animal that product they can't be sent to the, the factory or wherever for 56 days the other th uh, thing that happens after you give that animal the product is the the number of times they can get antibiotics or whatever so if you take these four bullet points here so animals for meat consumption, they can get one course of antibiotics within a 12 month period. Animals for breeding, so your suckler cow or your yos or dairy cows, they can get two courses of antibiotics within a 12 month period. For mastitis, you can get the, the cows can get two courses of antibiotics within a 12 month period. Um, and if they exceed that, the cow is removed from the herd. And that's what this line is saying as well. If the limits above are exceeded, then the organic status is taken away from the animal. And what happens in that scenario then is the animal typically either leaves the herd or uh, they can re-undergo a further 15-month uh, conversion period like that last line says there. So like if you take mastitis there, if you have to give your cow uh, tubes for three or four days running, that's a course of antibiotics. So do that twice in the year is permitted. Once you go over that though, it, the, the cow has to leave the herd. So there are, there are tolerances. You can use most products that are allowed in conventional. It's just, you have to get permission and you have uh, stricter withdrawal periods. The other key, I suppose, consideration that everyone has to kind of get right in their heads is the profitability. Will I make more money uh, by going organic? And the answer is you can in a lot of situations if it's done right. So I suppose the factors are land quality, look open an awful lot more options. You can grow more crops, you can carry a higher stocking rates, but that doesn't mean um, that the poor quality land can't be equally as profitable. Um, management skills have to be probably higher in organic farming. It's very easy to grow grass if you can go down to the co-op and buy a pallet of fertilizer to grow that grass. But if you have to try to grow that grass by using uh, clover and tools like that, it's, 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 it requires a higher skill set. Um, uh, we need to access markets. You are the key kind of reason behind organics is we're producing a premium quality food and we want to get paid a premium for that. And those premiums are available if you, if, if you're, if you uh, seek out those markets. Uh, the scheme support is hugely critical, so um, there's no need to apologise for getting the cheque in the post. This is what the consumer wants, and this is why these supports are there, uh, so um, they should be availed of. And uh, the consumer or the producer attitude then towards organics, can they work in, in harmony with nature? Are they, is there, uh, are they kind of environmentally inclined? And if they are, then they can really make in our organic farming work for them and make it extremely profitable. So let's talk about the market a bit. So what are the options? So like conventional farmer, there are plenty of processors in the organic sector. So if we look at the dairy, first of all, there's five processors in the country. There's a Revo, Arabon, Glenisk, the Village Dairy and the Little Milk Company. And most of them are actively be looking for new suppliers at the moment. In the beef side of things, we've good herdsmen in care. We have Slaney Meats in Wexford. And again, they're mad looking for cattle at the moment 
equipment and struggling to get them at the moment. Uh, the price at the moment in the factories is about 540 and rising to 560 next month. Uh, they do set their prices out a few months in advance, so you know exactly what you're going to get each month. Um, and that works out about 10 or 15 percent above conventional price at the moment. So there is a premium there. Uh, lambs, lambs are probably are the ones that struggle a bit because all our organic lambs come in probably a four month period between August and Christmas. Um, and we get a, a lot of them. So sometimes it can be a struggle to get all the lambs away as organic, but then there's a shortage, huge shortage of organic lamb for the other eight months of the year. Uh, so there is a body of work to be done there to, to maybe try flatten the curve, but also to uh, link maybe the, the hill sheep farmers in the West with specialized lamb finishing units in the, the Midlands and East. Um, and there is a shortage of those units in particular, and they are actually quite profitable uh, setups where they are done right. Um, and again, the Irish Country Meats in Wexford is the key outlet for the organic lamb. Uh, key pack there in that league also take them uh, from time to time. Um, and there are a number of smaller outlets as well um, up and down the country that will take them as well. So there are they're, they're the processor options. Then we have the direct sales options. So we'd say the picture there is the, the vegetables in the box. So in horticulture in partic particular, the direct sales are very popular. Um, and then a lot of good operators in that. And if you direct sell your products, you can uh, get a premium of over 200% um, or 100%, I suppose, uh, on what you would typically get in the supermarkets. Uh, we have people doing the beef in the box. We have people doing the lamb in the box. Um, so we have a lot of direct selling. We have milk vending machines going in across the country. So there's lots of ways of selling direct uh, to farmers markets also and other avenues. We can sell to other organic farmers. I suppose the most common one is the suckler farmer who would uh, ideally build up a relationship with specialized finisher units, which we have as well. And it works very well. Um, and the, the, it works well for both parties. Uh, equally, tillage farmers can, there's a huge opportunity Opportunity to create linkages with dairy and beef farmers in particular um, to grow uh, maybe whole crop silage, red, red clover silage on contract for these farmers. The last one then is the farmer led organized groups. So the best example of that is the little milk company where 13 dairy farmers came together to process their, their milk combined um, and they're now exporting the they, they process it into cheese and they're now exporting that cheese to France, Germany and America and it's a strong success and they're look, actively looking for 10 or 20 new suppliers at the moment. So it's an example of what could be done across a lot of the other sectors as well. So I suppose if, if, you, if you are seriously thinking about organics, then you, the main thing is to investigate, find out more information. What would I have to do to my farm? Uh, what would it look like on my farm? Uh, so there's a heap of farm walks. What I would say is I, my last slide shows some of them there, but put Chagas Organic Events into Google and it'll take you to all the events that are coming up over the next number of months. And there's a good variety there and a lot of them um, in in, in the Roscommon Longford region as well. Um, try to get to know what's in the standards and what's involved and talk to organic farmers. They're, they're a very helpful bunch and they're always eager to help uh, people that are thinking of getting into organics. Um, so the, this just shows, this gives a background of where we sit in the overall picture, uh, just at the, paint, uh, at the scene of organics in Ireland. So the EU average is 8.5% with the Austrias and Estonias and Swedes all above 20%, but we're down here at the second from the bottom. So if that was a league table, we'd be seriously in relegation trouble uh, there. So we're on 2%, um, but you could look at that as negative or you could look at it as a positive. What I would say that is there's huge room here to, to build on that because a lot of these countries over here now are starting to cap out that there's probably a limit on how much how many farmers you can convert to organics and they're starting to reach that limit. And if we look at this graph here, this top line here is the growth of organic retail sales across Europe for the last 20 years, from 2000 to 2020. And what has happened is it has gone up by 700% over that 20 year period. So this huge growth, and you can see that the rate it's climbing is, is getting sharper each year. So as we're moving on, the demand from the European consumer is growing at a massively rapid rate. The other line here at the bottom is the amount, the, the way the land is grown. So the amount of land is devoted to organic farming is, has grown by 300% but the demand is going by 700%. So demand is starting to outstrip um, supply in a lot of the key European countries, in particular, France, Germany, and the Dutch. And what they're now having to do is they're, they're going to be relying heavily on imported organic produce to meet their domestic demand. And in Ireland is, is ideally situated to capitalize on that market opportunity. 
This, as I said, is the series of walks that we have planned uh, to, there over the summer months. Um, so you can see there in Castle Ree, John Hurley's on the 1st of June is one that's probably local to a lot of people on this. We have a few in, in Offaly there also in Westmead, which wouldn't be a million miles away from, from people. So there's there's lots of enterprises there. There's lots of venues. So I would encourage everyone to try to get along to one of them if they can to, and to, to learn a bit more about organic farming. So that's my presentation on. I'll hand it back to you there. Super. Thanks for that, Joe. Um, I'll just give you a reminder for any of the attendees, um, the Q&A box is at the bottom of your screens. So any questions, just put them in and Joe and Enda will answer them at the end. Um, so Enda, if you want to share your screen there again, okay. um, we'll, uh, we'll get going on how to apply for the organic scheme. So is that, is that come through there, Owen? Yeah, that's it. Now end up perfect. Sounds right. Okay, grand. Okay, so look, I'm just going to talk you through the process in terms of uh, applying for an organic farming scheme. So you've made the decision that you're going to go organic, so but then you want to apply for the organic farming scheme. So what is the actual process in getting that done? Um, so look, I have a few slides here on, on the organic farming scheme and, and the conversion plan as such, all right? Um, so look, uh, the organic farming scheme that opened there, it opened on the 9th of February this year, 2022. So it's going to be open for two months and it closed there on the 8th of April. All right. So we have two months here to, to make the application. The budget that's allocated there is 5 million. And the expectation is that, you know, we get roughly in around 1,000 farmers into the scheme this year. Probably unlikely to hit that. Uh, last year, we got about 314 or 15 farmers in. Um, but look, uh, hopefully we get at least that in. But look, at the, the thousands is what the department is, is looking for to get in. So the, that, that's what the money is there for, okay? Um, so look, the first thing to do, if you're, go, if you're going to go, if you definitely made the decision to, to join Organics, your first protocol is, is to approach one of the two certification bodies in the country, all right? So the, one, the two certification bodies are... Uh, I, I, Irish Organic Association and Organic Trust, okay? And these are the two bodies that have been given the job of certifying the farmers or meeting the standards, organic standards each year. So the Department of Ag, who are the competent authority for, for organics in Ireland, so they're the people that police it and administer and that certify that the project is organic. They've given this job to these two bodies. So they're two private bodies. So basically you, you have to make a decision which of them you're going to run with. So. The, Next, next slide talks about the, the two. They're both identical. There's no difference whether you go to IOA or Organic Trust. They both work off the same standard, same rule book, same fees. So it's, it makes no difference which of them you want to, to run with. Okay, so one is based in Athlone and Organic Trust and is based in, in Kildare. So look, you make that call yourself, whichever is handiest for yourself, but absolutely no difference between either of the, the, two, the two bodies. Um, so basically, what they have... So what have you to do? So you have, when you ring those people up, they'll send you out a pack, all right, uh, an application pack. So there's kind of these six points here on this slide talk about the things that you have to send in, all right? So the first thing you have to do up is an organic conversion plan. So that's just a document that you put together. You're just going to document on paper how you're going to convert from uh, conventional environment to organic. So you have to write, put that down, okay? Uh, I see on the organic trust one, it's kind of built into their application form and the way one it's a separate document you put together right it's the same thing anyway no matter which 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 route you take okay so this takes I'll, i have a few slides on this organic conversion plan later on so we'll just walk away through that uh, later on okay but anyways that has to go off to, to the certification body your animal health plan now joe touched on it there all right so you have to get your vet on board here if you've got livestock so the vet needs to write down on paper what what are the known disease issues on your farms? What vaccinations you need to use? If you have trace element problems, all that kind of stuff. And that's and that's your template as such for your vet plan for the next five years. Okay. Another point I forgot to mention there is that if you do decide to go with organics, it is it is five year commitment. All right. So you have to stick with it for the five years. If you don't stick with it for the five years and you have to out after three years or four years, there is clawback. So just that, that that's an important point at the start. If I forgot to, to make so it is a five year commitment. All right. So. Conversion plan has to be done. The health plan, so you need to get onto your vet relatively quickly because we've only got a month now at this stage um, to get this done, all right, roughly. So get onto your vet, just a one page document, ask them to write down the bit of paper there. What are the health plans, the health issues on that farm and and, and what he, he thinks you should use, the drugs you should use and so on, the vaccines and then if there's stress on the front, whatever, write that down as well. Set of soil results there, if you have them, if they were taken within the last five years, they're applicable, they're fine, you can use those. If you have not, if you have, don't have any soil samples within five years, look, you'll have to get a sample, set, set of samples taken, um, probably getting late now, but you might get them back before the 8th of, uh, the 8th of April, but it's really tight. 
in any event, but get them done next back end if you don't have them, okay? You can send it off without them and, and just put a note with them, say that, you, that they'll follow us as soon as possible, right? Yard sketch, look for something very simple. You don't, it's not, it's not a, 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 a to scale a plan of sketch or anything that. For, uh, very 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 quickly do it up yourself farm maps you've all got farm maps there uh, from bps okay so you have those at home there in the, the this year's set all right in the pack there there'll be a thing, an org one form there okay this form here and um, so basically that's just a form department like form that you have to fill out that comes with the application pack you fill that out and send it off and there's one or two other little forms that come from the certification bodies themselves so they're the six kind of uh, checklist that you have to run through as such to, to, before you send off your documentation to the to the certification board. So basically, um, so how step two apply to the certification body uh, uh, to become an organic farming scheme. So what is the story? So once you have um, so once you've registered as an organic farm with, with our organic certification body, then you're in a position to to apply to the Department of Ag to join the OFS. So what happens is the documentation goes into the certification body. They look over it, then they will probably visit you, all right? And then take a look and see, is your application okay? Is it legit and everything in order? And if they're happy with that, then they give you a license, okay? And it's at that stage, and when you have your license, then the Department of uh, uh, sorry, the certification body notify the Department of Ag that you're now a registered organic um organic producer okay and it's at that stage then that there is if you go into ag food there on the left on the, on the left hand side of the screen there will be a tab there for ofs okay so when you click on that tab there at the moment and you're not a, not an organic um, organic farmer you, you, or you can go into it but you can't do anything you can't apply for it it's only once you you are registered with the department of ag the organic unit in johnstone there then you can actually go in submit click on that ofs tab and it becomes active and you can go in and and, and uh, su submit that application but look the 8th of the 8th of april is, is a deadline there for that so you get your you send in your you send in you send in your 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 document to, to the certification body they're happy with it they give you the license and on, it, roughly on the same day they notified the department of ag that you're now up and running and at that juncture then you can actually go and apply for the ofs so you have to go actually on on tag food click the uh, ofs tab and get that application submitted by the 8th of um, April, 2022, all right? That's just a month's time. The other thing that you've got to do too is, is like there's a few steps in this. The, step, the third step then is you've got to um, submit a BPS application, all right? So for those of you that are joining Organics the first time, there will be a little tab, little tick box on the BPS application uh, asking, are you, are you joining an Organics firm in 2022, all right? So if you tick that tab, then couple of new screens are generated okay so it'll, the one of the screens there is to de de declare your land status whether you're in conversion or organic for for 2022 there's two or three other little screens that you work with through there's nothing major on them but yeah that's that's the key the key the two key things to do there is, is is for guys joining organics for the first time is tick that box i think it's on the first page or second page of the, of the bps application and then that generates the, the the land details page for organic so you have to declare whether the land is in conversion or Organic. So in conversion, is, in case people didn't know, it takes two years in conversion before the land becomes truly organic. And once you kick into third year, then the, the land is, is deemed organic. All right. Okay. Again, that deadline for BPS is the 16th of May. So again, that's the so there's two deadlines here: the, the 8th of April for OFS, and the other deadline is to, to correct, do the correct tick boxes for uh, OFF, uh, for the organic farming scheme on, on BPS. All right. Um. The step fourth step then is to complete a 25 hour course on organic production. Um, now, if you have this course done from previous years, that's absolutely fine. That certainly do you 100% so that's grand. If you have it done, look at the bottom of the screen here, there is a deadline on it, the 1st of November, 2022. So it is, it's, it's, it roughly takes about four days. It used to, uh, pre-COVID, it was kind of three days in the office and, and then the final day was kind of out, uh, visiting farms to two farms um, and since the pandemic kicked in it probably was slightly different which was uh, webinars uh, sorry online for maybe three or four days and then there was there was a farm business involved but look that has to be done and uploaded onto onto the ofs um uh, ofs tab on our egg food by, by that date okay we're doing them there if you want to go into our public website there uh, click under the rural economy section there and you see organics or if you want to just that's the actual link there if you want to click on that link there you can you, you, you get into our organic page and in there you'll see a tab for training 
and in there you'll see an email address that you send off your details to that email address and that puts you on a list to do the actual um, uh, organic farming scheme. We're just one crowd, the other crowd they're doing it is, is, is not there and from Shambo also doing them as well, okay. There's a fee of about two, 200 or 220 to do that course. So it's sort of, ideally you'd have done this course beforehand, but look, because um, it, you know, it'll give you a good handle of what the thing is for you or not, but look, most people won't have this done, but uh, it has to be done and uploaded before the 1st of November. I mentioned the website, our own public website there, um, under the rural economy section there, under, and under organics, there's a wealth of information inside in that inside in that section of the website there about organics. And one of those documents in there is a step-by-step -step guide to conversion. Okay, it just it's about four or five page document. It just goes through the 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 details of of, of doing the conversion as such. Okay. And uh, now I have a few slides here in 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 about guidelines for completing organic conversion because it's probably. You know, it probably could take two or two two hours, I say, to do this from start from uh, from 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 stop to start or such. Or start to stop, sorry. Um. So basically, the conversion plan talks. There's two parts, right? The first part is historically what has happened with the farm up to now, and the second part talks in about how you're going to manage inorganics from now on. Okay. So the first part, look, and basically the certification bodies give you the headings. So the first four headings are the first the four 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 bullet points I've up on the screen there. Okay. So the first bullet point there is is historically what has happened on the farm, the physical characteristics of Holden, what is have what soil type have you, what's the drainage like on the farm, fencing, the size of the farm, are there any is there any archaeological features on the farm, is there any area for wildlife on the farm, just a, a few a few sentences on that the physical characteristics of the holdings, what they're looking for there. Again, current crop and if you're tillage farmers, they're going to look for your crop in details, uh, what's the soil fertility like and how you manage weeds, weed control up to now, all right. The next point, next paragraph that they're looking for a few words on is livestock enterprises. How you, what type of net buys you're running there at the moment? What kind of numbers have you? What's your winter housing like? What veterinary treatments have you used? And how have you managed slurries, farm manures in the past? And the last point there is, is in, in the event that you have, uh, you want to keep some of the land conventional, or you have, sorry, you have a, a, a separate enterprise or a separate species there that you want to run conventionally. You can partially convert in organics, all right, but you must have two separate species on the farm. So what I mean by that, let's just say you had a cattle and sheep enterprise on your on your farm there. You could decide just to put the cattle enterprise in, in, in into organics and leave the sheep one outside it, all right, okay? So if, if that's going to happen, that has to be outlined at, at this juncture, okay? And, and let them know that that is the, the process, all right? So if you're going to do that, a partial conversion, um, basically those uh, two blocks as such, two, two enterprises have to, two species have to be have to totally separate and, and no mixing is allowed. Okay, so going on to the second part of the conversion plan then. So basically what you're talking about here is how, you, how you're going to manage, how you're going to survive in organics, all right? Again, the first thing they want to know is a bit of general information there is how are you going to demonstrate a sustainable organic system will be achieved? Okay, so just one, on two or three lines there, how are you going to survive organically? What, how, how that's going to run and what the enterprise is going to be? Okay, not, not, not a major um, essay, just a couple, of, a couple of sentences on that. Crop notations, I'm not going to talk about, just in, well, just in case there are people on the call here that have tennis crops, um, you're going to have to nominate there how your what your crop and rotations be and, and your crop and plan. So that's going to have to be in, in on the, this conversion plan. Um, the third point there that I want a bit of information on is soil fertility maintenance. How soil fertility is going to be maintained? How are you going to handle your slurries and farm your manure? Once you go into organics, you know, you don't have access to nitrogen fertilizers or, or, or the, the, the conventional fertilizers. So you have to kind of think about this, you know, what's the lime status on my fields there? Uh, you know, if it's really low at the moment, you know, that's one good reason, a way of, of kind of improving your soil fertility. Um, I think you need to manage your, your, your slurry a wee bit better as well, a little bit better than you have maybe in the past. If you typically were spreading your slurry, say, in the summer at the back end, you know, making that switch to the spring will make will get, mean you get better utilization of the nutrients in that slurry. Um, so things like that, you know, it, it, it kind of gets the farmer to think about how, how this thing is going to work. Now, some people ask their advisors to do it, it's way better experience if you go and do it yourself because it forces you to think how this thing is going to work for me on the ground, all right? Um, the next thing then is a, a, a rotation, the, the grazing rotation that you want to employ once, once you decide to go into organics. Again, ideally, if you're set stocked, probably not, not great in terms of trying to minimize parasites on, 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 on the farm there. So if you have could operate some sort of rotation grazing system, it would minimize the, the 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 parasite burden on the farm. So at least you know animals are are going out to fresh pastures every three three weeks or so. So that, that would be a, a, an ideal thing to, to try and do if you could, all right. Um, 
The next thing they want you to talk about here is how you're going to manage weeds and pests and disease and that kind of stuff. So in a grassland situation, look, you're going to have to accept there's going to be some bit of weeds there. It's not the end of the world, right? And up this neck of the woods, certainly in the north of the county here, you know, where we have wettish ground, look, rushes are, are going to be a problem. They are a problem. They always have been a problem. What can you do in organics to try and address the issues? Look, you're talking about maybe lime and what rush, the two things lime, the rush that rush likes is, is wet, 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 wet soils and, and acid soils. Okay. So if you put out lime, you probably do something to, to address that problem. And drainage, you know, existing drains, just try and tidy those up as such. Um we'll do something for it, all right. And after that, then it's just topping. Okay. So there's well, there, that's the big the big issue around here, and then maybe a little bit of dark and silage fields, and um, they're the issues from a, from, from a grassland point of view. If you're, if you are, if there are people on the call here that have tillage, then look, you need to, I wouldn't have much experience on this, but uh, you know, there are some pests and diseases from on tillage crops that you might need to, maybe need to talk to someone about how, how, how best to control those, okay? Um, the next thing they want you to talk about then under the next heading there is the stock type and the numbers, that basically the, the, the type of farming system you want to run, okay, and the numbers involved. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. The third point here on the screen, on the slide here, talks about feed. How are you going to grow enough sufficient feed for your livestock? Okay, so that I think that's a good one for guys to think about. So let's just say, for instance, at the moment there, you 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 and you're not going to cut your stock pretty low at the moment. Let's just say you might stock a one livestock unit per hectare there, and normally it takes and and you don't tend to reduce stock numbers. And you may, let's just say two hundred bales got you through the winter. You know, suddenly you don't have any nitrogen fertilizer there, so suddenly that might be down at 120, 130 bales. How are you going to make up that shortfall? Okay, so these are the things you need to think about. Um, do I need to take up an extra bit of ground? Do I need to go for second cut? Do I need to reduce numbers further? Whatever. These are the things that gets you to think about. And then during the summertime, during the grazing situations, there, am I going to have enough grass for my stock? Okay, um, and how am I going to handle that? All right. So look. Um, for, for the typical guy that's stocked around this neck of the woods here, that's stocked in around a livestock unit, um, 0.9, one livestock unit per hectare, typically the way it works on the ground is, is you, you tend to grow enough grass during the summer grazing season. If the stocking rate goes up, then if you want to become more intensive, for what, like what Joe was showing there, maybe up to 1.5, 1.6 livestock units per hectare, then clover becomes your main um, your main driver. So you've got to have white clover in, 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 in your in your, in your, in your, in your uh, grazing swords. And you're certainly looking at a, a bit of red clover side to, to try and, and, and get a good wake in on stock. All right. So they're the kind of things that you have to look at if you want to run an intensive organic system. Um, the next thing there is animal housing plan. Look, a quick the yard sketch is there. You just as I said, it doesn't have to be done to scale or anything. A quick yard sketch on, on, on a piece of paper will be fine. But you do need to list out the animals that are going to be used for animal housing. And the numbers that are going to be allocated, each of those houses has to be explained on the plan. Okay. Animal bedding there, uh, Joe had a slides on it too, but look, basically you have to specify the exact materials to be used. It is a bit of a cost for, for most organic farmers in the sense that they do have to buy straw. Okay, we don't have to use straw. You can use rushes or you can potentially use sort of um, sawdust, for instance, as long as it's not treated wood, so there's no preservative on the wood. Um, but peat is not a runner. Okay, so if peat isn't sustainable, so that's why it's not a runner. Okay, so you're looking at straw, Brushes or some uh, wood chip if it if it's as long as no trees on it or sawdust and that kind of stuff they, they're all all fine, but that is a cost uh, in organics that if you, if you haven't been using straw or very little straw, it is an extra cost to the system there and for for a lot of organic farmers. The the last four points are fairly straightforward. Fencing basically you know um, you, every farmer at this stage I would hope has in their the boundaries are stock proof. You have to have for for BPS and all yourself all your boundaries have to be stock proof. You can, uh, the next thing talks about your water. What source of water do you have on the farm? There, are you working on mains or a well or, or whatever? Um, they also like to know there in terms of management plan for conservation areas. So if you have an areas for wildlife on the farm, there, just mention it and just mention how you're going to maintain it. They don't, they won't just don't have to actually do, do anything to, to improve it, but they want you to maintain it. Uh, archaeology there. Look, every farmer should know what archaeology is on the farm there. If you don't, just Google sites and minus record there, and there's a map in there, and it can show you exactly all the archaeological sites that are that are up on up, up on up on a map. Okay. And the last point there are restricted practices that you have to list. So basically, there are a couple of things that you need to list. If you intend to do a bit of seed, and then you can't get organic seed. If you want to apply for non-organic seed, apply for derogation. The veterinary inputs that you, that are that, that are going to be used as well need to be to be listed there. Okay. So look, that's the the, the conversion plan. If you were to sit down from stop to start, you look. I, I'd be honest with you. You're talking about maybe two to three hours to get that done because it is there's a bit of work in it. All right. Okay. Um. Now the terms and conditions of the organic farming scheme for 2022. Um. 
So basically, to be eligible for joining organic farming scheme this year, look, the minimum area for grass and farmers or tillage farmers is, is really three, three hectares, okay? So you have to have seven and a half acacres, okay? If you're in the horticultural side of the veg, food and veg, that kind of stuff, you have uh, the minimum area is one hectare, two and a half acres, okay? Second point here talks about reaching this um, minimum ranking of, of 25 marks. So I'm just going to scroll on to the next slide here and you'll see what the, these are the, 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 the the ranking points is allocated, okay? Look, 25 points is going to be the minimum. So every farmer has to get that minimum. But the, if you take a look at this table here, you will see very quickly, it's nearly impossible not to get 25 marks, okay? We don't foresee a situation where there's more than a thousand applications. No, it could happen, but it's extremely unlikely. So that means everybody will pretty much get in, okay? Whereas that's different to what, if I was talking to you, maybe 12 months ago, ranking and selection will was probably more was more of an issue okay but anyways if as you look down along each row here you see a young farmer if he's under 40 he, under 41 he gets 40 marks again if you take a look at they have a prioritized sort of um tillage farmers and dairy farmers the, the, the cereal farmers get 100 marks dairy guys get 100 marks and horticulture people get 100 marks beef or sheep farms only get 10 all right but look we're going to the next cut next row here and um, if you put all your farms farming you get 10 marks here if you put 50 percent in you get five marks okay let's go on to the next row um, the number of hectares you have. So if you put in 20 hectares, you get 20 marks. If you put in 50, you get 50 marks. Okay, but 50 is a limit. If you get 70, you just get 50 as well. Uh, sorry, I'm just going. Uh, so the other two, look, it's very, it's next, next to impossible not to get 25 marks. Okay, but look, at the same time, just pay heed to it. If, 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 but I don't think it's, it's, it's nearly impossible to, to actually not get 25 marks. Okay, the payment rates here um, for tillage farmers, just in case there are some tillage people on the call here. Um, so look for in conversion, there's the first two years. Of for the first up to the first 20 hectares, the payment rate is 260 euros a hectare. Between 20 and 70 hectares, we're looking at 220 a hectare here. And any area over over 70 hectares uh, gets 60 euros. So once you kick into the third year, then you get 170 up to 20 hectares. Between 20 and 70, you get 170 and you get 30 thereafter. So those are the tillage payment rates. These are the horticultural payment rates. Um, for horticultural areas, less than six hectares is 300 in conversion, 220 between six and 70, and anything over 70 uh, attracts a payment of 60, 60 euros a hectare. And then full organic status, then once you have once you kick into the third year, this is what the payment rates are at, they're 200, 170, and 30, okay? And look, there is, uh, I suppose at the bottom, there is an extra 30, uh, 30 euros per hectare available um, if you want to do red clover, both in the tillage and the, and the, and the horticulture and the, the, the typical uh, livestock farms. Okay, this is the, the side that's probably most applicable to people on the call here, and um, all other holdings. So these are the, the, the livestock farmers we're talking about, really, in, in essence. The payment between three and seven hectares is two twenty, and for every hectare over seventy, you get sixty hectares in conversion for the first two years, and then in the third, from three years three, four, and five, you get one seventy a hectare, uh, between three and seventy, and thirty hectares, thirty euros per hectare over seventy. And this additional uh, 30 euros a hectare is available if you decide to put in a red clover mix for silage, okay? Um, so th that's 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 the slides, okay? Um, I don't show sure where I'm at the time there, but hopefully wasn't, I didn't go too, too, too badly, all right? Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing there, if that's, if that's all right. Great. Thanks, Enda. Thank you. Um, so I'll just ask Joe and Penny to come in there and come back in. Um, um, I, I don't think I can turn on my camera there for some reason it's telling me the host has stopped it so i'm not sure if you can turn it on from your side yeah yep no um so just the lads are covering a lot there so anyone just again to remind you any questions just pop them into the q a box at the bottom and um and we'll ask the lads then them questions um so i'll hand it over to you penny and you can ask away thanks a million Owen. we have a lot of questions guys so um Bear with me as, we, as I work my way through them. Um, the first one is just kind of clarifying something Owen said at the very beginning. Owen, um, just could you just clarify what abbreviations you used in your introduction there? I think it was B BPS and AETS. Yeah, uh, well, BPS is the is the application basically that farmers fill out to to get their direct payments. Um, I suppose some farmers might call it single farm payment, might know it as that. Um, the AETS then is the Agri Environmental Training Scheme. It's a, it's a new scheme that's going to be coming out in the next few months. Um, it's basically a training day where any farmer that, that wants to get more information on environmental practices, schemes, 
um, they can get onto their local Chagas office and there'll be a, a one-day scheme where the farmers will receive 156 euro for taking part in the day. Great, thank you. Um, then I think this one came in, this question came in, Joe, during your presentation. Can you use Sobac enzyme in organic fertilizer? Uh, yes, a lot of the Sobac products are, are, are allowed in organics and a lot of organic farmers would be, well, I won't say a lot, some organic farmers would be using the Sobac products. Um, any product like that, the one thing I would say though is check with your certification body um, that, they, that they're okay because uh, even within the certification bodies, they can have different takes on the different products. So just no matter what you're bringing in the gate, if you're anyway unsure about it, just double check with your certification body that you're, you are allowed to use it. Great, perfect. Um, is there a processor for organic poultry in the country? Uh, no, is the short answer. Um, any of the people doing the, the poultry are direct selling and processing it themselves. Right. I might give this one to Enda. Um, if you decide to go into organics, how long does it take? Well, yeah, basically you make the decision to, to join, okay. Um, and then you start that, that paper process that um, that I, I talked my way through there. So look, uh, for this round of, of OFS, look, the, we, the deadline there is, is the 8th of April. So basically you have to get all your information together. Okay, and you submit your conversion plan and all your documents to the certification body. If they're happy, they will come out on an inspection. If they're happy with your application, they give you a license. And then at that juncture, then you can go apply for the OFS. So look, it is doable between now between now and, and the 8th of April. Um, of April. I forgot to mention on the talk I was given there, look, the, the thing will open, the scheme will open again in, in the last quarter of this year as well, in case you don't, if, if, in the event that you don't make it by the, the 8th of April um, this time around. So it, 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 to be honest, to sit down and if, let's just say you've all the information together, your soil analysis and your vet plan and everything together, it's at least a three hour operation, I would say, at least to get all the stuff together and, and, and get your field maps together and, 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 and list and, and number your fields. And because part of the, the, of the conversion plan talks about a history of the fields, what has happened last year, this year, and, 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 and maybe the next two years forward as well. So there's a bit of work with it, but it, it's doable. It's not. And it, it's work that I think the farmers should do themselves or, or should try to do it. Uh, like we're always at the end of a phone call if farmers need to need to some clarification on, on some points or other. But yeah, it, 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 there's a bit of work putting it together, but it's, it's not. It, it's about three hours, I would say, to work minimum to put a, the, that, the material together to submit to the conversion plan, uh, to the certification body, I think. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and this person is just wondering, do they need a course to get into organic beef? Uh, I'll take that one. Um, yes, you have to do the course. Yes, if you want to, if you're going for OFS, you must you must do that course. And um, again, if you haven't done it at this stage, you have until the first November to get it done. Um, so get go onto our own public website there and uh, go into the get into the organics tab there, and you will see an email address there that you send your details off, and that gets you on the on on the list for for courses and such. So once they have a we have a group together. In an area, we run the course in that area for, for people in that area. Okay, so you need to list your 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 name and your address and, and the type, the livestock, the enterprises that you're running there. And I think that's about maybe something else that I'm missing there, but that's about it. I think. Great, thank you, um, Joe. I might give you this one. Um, if you're accepted into the scheme during the the two year conversion period, can you spread fertilizer at a reduced rate, tapering off towards year three when fully converted? Uh, if the question is chemical fertilizer, then the answer is no, you can't spread it. Once you, uh, once you send off the paperwork that Inda is talking about there and you send off your application to the certification body, you're an organic farmer from that day, albeit in conversion, um, and you can't use any uh, chemicals after that date. So whether they be fertilizers or pesticides. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I might go back to you. Can cattle and sheep be outwintered on sandy hills in organics? Yeah, look, cattle, uh, cattle and sheep can be at winter. I, I, I suppose the certification would well, prefer to see everything out winter if, they, if, if that was possible. But look, you know, if your stock is, is at such a high level that you're going to damage the ground, damage the soil, then we, obviously we have to go inside. But look, I think, you know, the cross compliance rules, which is about one livestock, uh, so one livestock unit per two and a half acres, roughly, is, is the stocking rate that, that, that operates. So, in other words, if you had 10 cows out, you'd have to give them 25 acres from now then or something like that, you know. But you can do it, there's no problem, absolutely. Yeah, you can, the cattle and sheep can be overwintered so long as they don't start damaging the ground and, and poaching it, you know. Perfect, thank you. Um, Joe, what type of soil analysis would you recommend for converting land in process of setting up organic mixed market garden and small livestock, pasture grazed pigs? 
Uh, yeah, Chagas have a range of soil services that we offer clients. Um, and it, it very much depends on what you're doing. So we'd say for your, the likes of that query there, the pigs, your basic S1 sample, your um, peak, so your phosphorus, your potash and your lime, that's your basic one that would do fine. For the mixed gardening, if especially if there's root crops, I would be saying you'd go for what's called an S5, which is a horticultural sample. Um, and you're just testing for a few of the, the trace elements. And I suppose the boron in particular there, if you're growing root crops, is the one that you'd be you'd be after. The the basic one is 25 euros a sample. The horticultural one is 43 euros a sample. So really, I'd be saying I'd be su suggesting you use a mixture of the two and use the, the S1 on the grassland part and use the S, S5 sample on the where you plant to sort of crops. Perfect, thanks. Um, and uh, do I get access to the rare breed payment through the organic scheme the same way as work as it works through the gloss scheme? No, no, not um, no. The, the organic farming scheme is just for organic farming, right? Uh, to get uh, the payment on the rare rare breeds, that comes through your 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 um, your gloss scheme or your new organic environmental scheme when it kicks off in twenty twenty three, but not through not through the OFS. No. Great, thank you. Um, Joe, I have a dry bedded shed. Can I use wood chip as bedding? Yes, wood chip is one of the products that is permitted, yeah. As okay. long as there's no chemical treatments on the wood chip. Okay. Um, and uh, is weed licking allowed on organic farms to control all weeds in grassland? No, no no herbicides are allowed on organics, full stop, no, no. no. So it's really just top and you're looking at, okay? Yeah, perfect. Um, Joe, I might give you this one. Um, I'm a 28 year old farmer in which I've had my herd number in my name for over five years now, disqualifying me from the 60% TAMS grant on machinery, equipment, buildings, etc. For me to join the organic scheme, I'll require certain equipment and machinery. However, my Achilles heel is that I'll now only be able to avail of a 40% grant. Giving rising costs and the requirements for me, for me to have this equipment, will the grant rates increase from 40% and if so, by how much? Thanks. Uh, yeah, the grant rate is 40% for that farmer, as they have rightly outlined. The, I know the department have submitted uh, their proposals for the 2023 scheme to Brussels for approval. And as far as I'm aware, the 50% the is what's been sought. Uh, whether that will be granted or not remains to be seen. But that's that's the kind of the current state of play. So I think the best that that uh, person can wish for is 50%. All right, thanks. Um, and uh, do you think it would be an option if you had no animal housing um, to, to just have summer grazing as well? Yeah, you could do if you didn't have summer, yeah, if you didn't have access to housing, yeah, you could summer graze, but the downside that is that you'd have to buy organic cattle. Okay, so that's probably that wasn't mentioned on, on the call here, but once you go into organic, um, you have to buy organic cattle from then on as such. You know, there is one exception to rule there. If you're a breeding herd, you can bring in, let's just say you're 20 cows, you can bring in up to 10% of that um, in, in replacement. The replacements that come in can be uh, from conventional sources. So you could actually bring in, say, two two maiden heifers there but if you're somewhere grazing look yeah you can do it no no problem but you're going to have to source organic cattle okay but and there are a series of organic marts to take place throughout the countryside there's quite a few there in Drumsham every year there's one or two in in, in Roscommon and, and Elfin as well from time to time so they do take place and, and that's where you'd have to source again so if you go into organics that's one thing you need to be aware of yes you, you can do uh, uh, summer grazing is fine but it has to be organic stuff that you you, you source as such yeah, I might Perfect. come in. I might, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I might come in at that one as well, if you don't mind, Penny. Yeah, I'd agree 100% there with, with what, what Inda is saying. Um, because the stocking rate has been lowered from the half to the 0.15. Previously, it probably was going to be very hard for farmers to meet the minimum stocking rate by summer grazing, but now that is probably achievable. But in this point is very valid is um, if everyone is looking to buy organic stock in the months of March, April, May, um, there could there could be uh, a shortage at that time of the year for summer grazing. Um, so uh, I would just maybe that would be the caveat in the system. The other thing, the question we often get asked as well is that... Um, a lot of people maybe think that you, you have to sell your existing herd before you go into organics. So if you've a herd of suckler cows um, or a flock of yours, you can bring them into organics with you. Or the same with a herd of dairy cows. Um, they will never become organic, but their progeny will be. So your suckler cows, um, their calves, after they've done their two-year conversion period, the, once the cows have done the two-year conversion period, those suckler calves will be organic, but the cows themselves will never be. And when it comes to them being sold on, they're sold to your traditional conventional uh, route. Perfect. I suppose tying into that, um, 
just this person was wondering, can you buy in calves from a conventional herd? You can. Now, there's, there's, again, there's a few issues. One of the key, like if you're buying calves, you're more, I presume this person is buying them from a dairy farmer. Um, so, but one of the rules in organics is that all calves have to receive whole milk for the first 90 days of life. Um, so either the organic dairy farmer is willing to feed them the, the whole milk or else you have a few cows that you're willing to either uh, to double suckle or to milk to feed these calves. Um, that's the only way. So it, it is one of the kind of the quirks in the system um, that makes it not the easiest thing to get around. Um, it probably is a, a system there for someone. If someone was willing to buy the calves off the dairy farmer and equally buy maybe two or three cold cows with them, there probably is a profitable system there for someone to, to look into. All right. Perfect. Thanks. Um, I might just come back to you and I was asking you about gloss earlier. Um, this person is wondering if a farmer is currently in gloss or any subsequent in environmental scheme is that land eligible for the organic payments yeah as i'm talking to you today um yeah we probably wasn't mentioned there yet the ofs and and gloss so the area based actions in gloss and um, they won't you won't get double payment on on on, on, on gloss and ofs all right there is some talk under the new in, in 2020 you know, the new the new um cap strategic plan that you may get some part of payment, on, uh, OFS payment on those area-based uh, fields, for instance, all right? So let's just say the field in traditional hay meadow or, or lip, look, that field as it stands today only gets the gloss payment on that, all right? It doesn't get OFS, which is a downside to the scheme. And that's probably, I wasn't mentioned, but it, it is a problem, all right? The hope is that um, in 2023, that there be at least some payment. That's that's my understanding of, of the call I was on there um, recently with the department. You now, Joe, you may have a different uh, take on that, but that, that's my, my reading on it. Uh, yeah, you want to come in on that there, Joe? You? Yeah, that's that's the pretty much the, the same gist I have, is that uh, the hope maybe is that the new agri-environmental scheme is maybe results-based, and if the results-based, then the double payment issue isn't as much of an issue. Um, so at the moment, it is one of the issues with gloss and with that uh, the low-input permanent pasture and organics can't be paid in the same field. Uh, but hopefully, when we see the details of the new agri-environmental schemes, we'll know more on that towards the end of the year. Perfect. Thanks. Um, this person just wondering, how do you manage with a six bay slotted house with no lie back area? Um, do they give a grant, give a good grant to put in a lie back? And then someone else was asking about um, grants for sheds. So you might just combine them to, two together and if you. OK, six, a six bay slot house with no creep on at the moment. And you want to use it going forward in organics. Uh, basically, if, if you're applying now, um, you'd have there has to be a creep on it. I'll be honest with you. The cattle have to have access to a solid lie back area. All right. So if you don't have a creep, if you, you will need to put a creep on it. Okay. The other option, if you're not going to do that, is to take out half the slats and put in solid slabs. There's grant aid for that. So those those are your two op uh, options. You had to put in a creep area for 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 uh, the, the number of animals that you're going to hold in that house. Fail on that, and if you're not willing to put up um, to put up a creep, um, you're, you're talking about removing those slats and putting in solid slabs okay there's granted for that under under the OFS and um, TAMS uh, scheme there at the moment so that those are your two actions yeah options as such yeah. there's no getting around that it's, it's probably just that's the reality of organics cattle have to have access to a solid line, solid line area perfect um Joe what is the policy on rotating animals so poultry sheep pigs and beef is it allowed rotating kind of rotational grazing i presume is the question is it yeah uh, it's not not clear but i presume um, so yeah no there's 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 no issue the, a lot of them actually complement each other um what was it uh, cattle sheep and poultry sheep pigs and beef poultry sheep pigs and beef um there's there's no issue doing it they'll complement each other um the pigs i suppose in particular are the ones that will fairly root up a place and uh, so you you won't be able to do much after the pigs for a couple of months so they might be the ones that wouldn't fit into the rotation the other three will fit in perfectly because um, if the cattle are getting even a bit of grain in the shed the, the poultry will will pick that grain out of the dung and so on and they'll they'll actually work quite well together the sheep will graze weeds that the cattle won't graze so they do actually complement each other the pigs are the one maybe that might need their own space Thanks, Joe. Um, and I'm going to come back to you about the buildings again. There's more yeah. questions coming in. Um, is it possible to rent a slotted house that's part of another shed, but is separate and has a zone handling unit? And another person wants to ask if the lie back has to be roofed. 
Is it possible to rent a slot house? At the, so you don't own this shed as such, is it? Correct? Yeah, I'd be renting, yeah. renting slot, as high, slot shed, yeah. Um, if, if I think, I have never come across that now, but I think uh, if you're doing that and it has a, a lieback area and, and, and it, it, you're able to bed it, it should be okay. But you need to be able to guarantee that you have security of tenure on it for at least the duration of the scheme, I would think, you know, that you'd have it for five years minimum, I, I would think, you know. There's that possibly be a DVO issue there as well, yeah. and that they can't have shared their space. Um, yes, so it'd have thing. to be a totally separate, yeah. totally separate building. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, if yeah. it's a separate building, it, it, I would say it's doable. But if, mm. it's, if, it, if it's, if it's two pins either side of a common feed passage under the one roof, no, no, uh, no, no, it, no. It's, it's not a runner. So, and the second question is: solid lie back. Does it have to be roofed? Um, well, look, I suppose that's one for you. You want to run that one by the certification, but I know one guy in this county that is doing that. It has a, an unroofed lie back, um, but I would run that by the certification body before you actually get certainty on it. Um, yeah. Um, perfect. We might just have a few questions here. We might have to um, to, to call it a day on, on after one or two more, and maybe if people have questions, they can get in contact with you themselves, they're, they're still coming in. So um, this is another question. Can I convert forestry land that, that did not receive any grants into organic farming land? No. Forestry land? Sorry, if I, you know, once land is planted, it's gone forever, isn't that my reading? You can never yeah, you, you're, only, land, you're only getting paid on, on grassland area. Yeah, in, in, yeah, yeah. It's an area-based scheme, and they won't pay on forestry land. Perfect. Um, do you not get paid for the first three hectares? You do, yes, you, do. you get yeah. paid, yes, you do, yeah, yeah. yeah perfect. Um, and there's another question. Can you start Can you start sheep farming during your organic scheme so while you're already in it, I presume? Yes, you can. You'd have to buy organic sheep. Yes, organic sheep, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, are the courses in line, online or in person? Sorry. Courses, yeah, the courses we typically run them over um, five weeks. So we'd say we have a course starting there in April now, and uh, it'll run for five Thursdays. So the first four Thursdays will be ten o'clock to one o'clock on Zoom, and then the fifth Thursday will be a farm walk. Um, again, well, there'll be an exam on the morning of the fifth day, uh, followed by a farm walk. Correct. Um, then, and I suppose. Um, do you know when Gloss or the REAP scheme are opening up again for new applications? Um, the new Gloss scheme apparently will open in the uh, probably June or July of, of this year. The new, the new, the new, the new, um, the new agri environmental scheme. Um, so you'll be the, the department will be looking for people to to apply for that at that stage and maybe get plans done in, in in the next in the next couple of months after that. Um. So basically, when then with a start update then of the first of, of, of January on it. Okay, so yeah, you will be finding that in in, in, in the next few two or three months that the the, the new ACM as they call it will be open up in 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 June or July. Okay, and we'll be looking for applications. Um, the other part of the question there, Penny, was what in terms of OFS is there something? Sorry, I missed. The... Um, yep, there's Gloss and, and Reap. And REAP, uh, is it the inter Sorry, I missed the second part of the question there. Is REAP open again? No, REAP is just a pilot. It's just a once off. Okay, it won't open again. So REAP was run just as a trial scheme to see how results based schemes work on the ground. Okay, so there will be some some of the actions in the new ACM will be results based. So really, REAP was just a pilot to see how it actually runs on the ground. So REAP won't be open again. It's just a two year scheme last year and this year, and then that's it. It won't be open again. No. Everybody will be going into the new ACM in, 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 in 2023. Brilliant. I think we'll have to, to call it an evening there. Um, I'm sure there's a few sm like small questions that you've kind of covered. So um, I suppose we'll just mention that the, the recording of this webinar will be online. If people want to look back on it, it'll be on our, our YouTube page. And I'm sure the lads will be happy to hear from me if you, if you want to ask them anything else. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, yep. Penny. Um, sure, look, lads, we're gone a few minutes over time. And it's, uh, it's great to see that many questions in. Um, just thanks, Enda, and thanks, Joe. There was an awful lot of material in them presentations, and it was uh, the questions were answered very well. So thanks, lads, and thanks everyone for tuning in as well. And hopefully, we'll see you sometime soon. Talk to you all soon. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.